So I remember getting the email, going through the preaching schedule, and my name was further down the list. So I'm like, oh, this is great. We've never done this before. All these beautiful core values, and I'm going down one by one, and I'm like, yes. Then I saw my name, and I saw diversity, and there was a screeching halt for a moment, being honest. Because when I thought of diversity at first, my mind didn't necessarily go immediately to the scriptures that I'll be preaching. It first went to the climate we're living in and all of the things that are so divisive and all of the differences that are at the crux of political issues right now. And at first I was like, whoa, like this is kind of a beast. But then, I went to the scriptures and it was so refreshing to see that through every age, God has spoken to us about diversity and it was refreshing that his word is very clear. While your social media news feed and CNN and Fox, they may be very chaotic, that there is clarity in the scriptures on all of our differences, not just our physical differences, but also our generational differences. So we're gonna look at our core value. It's on the screen. And can we read it together? Let's read it together. We embrace cultural, ethnic, gender, socioeconomic, and generational diversity where everyone equally and fully participates in the priesthood of believers, body of Christ, Diversity deepens our understanding of the uniqueness of our various experiences, which enriches our lives and ministries. These core values are accessible on the website with the scripture references as well. So we read through the passage before, earlier, and we are gonna revisit it again. But I mentioned all of the negativity sometimes that can be attached to diversity. And you can say certain things that will divide a room. But we at Bridge of Hope, we've been given something different. So my prayer is that this message brings us closer together and allows us to be people who embrace the unity that Christ calls us to. And so instead of trying to split and polarize our room, we're going to divide God's word and apply it to our lives. So we read earlier Romans 12. 3 through 10. I'm going to read it again in the NLT version. And then I'll pray. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Don't just pretend to love others, really love them hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good, love each other with genuine affection, and take delight in honoring each other. Lord, here we are coming to the table of your word, and we hold it up today as the highest authority. There's so many voices, God, so many things to say about our differences, but Lord, we affirm that your word is truth. God, that it is sharper than any two-edged sword. And so we take this family moment, we sit around your word and we ask you to have an honest conversation with us, God, 
through this preaching time that we can walk away with more than we came with, Lord, with clarity that we didn't have, God, with healing that we need, God, and that we would be ready to walk forward, valuing our diversity, not taking it for granted, not letting things threaten it, God, but ready to uphold it as our value more and more, O oh Lord. Hide me, God. Be heard, Lord. Hide me, Jesus. Have your way in this word. In Jesus' name, amen. So today's topic is diverse by design, exalting Christ through our differences. And I do want to clarify, there are limits to the type of diversity we're talking about. We're talking about diversity that according to the scriptures is biblical diversity. And in the core value, it includes cultural, ethnic, socioeconomic, gender, and generational. There are other types of diversity. So if you're in a work setting and you get trained on diversity nowadays, there's a new minority. And it's not about race. The new minority is sexual orientation or even gender identity. So you'll hear those two as well within diversity. But this message today through me is not talking about those types of diversity. That's another message for another day by Pastor Trevor and not by me. So we have to understand that there is a limit to what we're talking about. We're not just considering all types of diversity, amen? Today we're focused on biblical diversity. So when you consider our culture, there's Southern culture, there's the Northern, you hear of the New York and culture, different ways of life. We're saying we value all of those, that there is not one superior or less than another. When we're talking about ethnicity, that includes our race, that includes um, Hispanic and Latino, and we're recognizing that each one is equal, that there is no superior ethnicity than any other ethnicity. Same with gender, right? Male and female. We are saying we value female and male equally. And we see it through the leadership here. We see it all the way through from the international church movement we're a part of to our state and here that there is not a gender elevated over another. There's different characteristics given to each, but we are honored the same in Christ, amen? Generational. So every generation in this church, from our infants who receive ministry, they don't receive just daycare, but thank God they receive ministry in the nursery all the way up to our seasoned seniors. Every generation has a place in our vision. Every generation has a calling. The teenagers, they're not left out. Um, you'll see our children worshiping here. We're saying that every generation has a place in God's kingdom and is equally valued in our church. So that is a simple overview of what we're saying in our core value. The scripture tells us a lot of truth about diversity. On Wednesday nights, the church is going through a class called Confronting Christianity, and this is a quote from the book, Confronting Christianity, by Rebecca McLaughlin. It says, Christianity is the most ethnic, culturally, eth ethnically, culturally, socioeconomically, and racially diverse belief system in all of history. And that's based on the fact that it unites us across age, gender, race, culture, and country of origin. Everyone is impacted by issues of diversity as well. Let that be clear. It's a universal issue. It's something that we are all touched by, whether we're aware of it or not. We all play a role in diversity. Nobody gets an out. You can't ignore diversity and make it go away. And you've got to know that your experiences impact others' experiences. Your presence is important because it impacts and it enriches all of our experience here and outside of here. A perfect example is if you've ever been in a situation where you're in a room and let's say everyone in the room is 15 years younger than you or 15 years older than you, that impacts your experience. And you being there enriches the experience of everyone else that's not like you. If we go back to the beginning, a lot of times as things are happening in society that are troubling, you need to go back to where things started to kind of get an answer as to what the Lord may will and what he may be doing because our differences 
are not coincidental. They come from God. Colossians 1 and 16 reads this, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things and in him all things are held together. See, he could have made us all the same. Have you ever thought about that? Like God really has the power to make us all identical. He could have picked one quote unquote perfect race, perfect person, perfect age, and made us all be formed that way. And here we are, a bunch of robots. He could have made a bazillion gillion brints and covered the earth with them. And that was his creation, right? And he's looking like we'd be in trouble. And I would agree, we'd be in trouble. But he didn't do that. He did the opposite. No two people ever are alike. Everybody look at your thumbprint. I'm sorry, I'm an object lessons preacher. Your thumbprint has a design on there. And in all the people who've ever lived on this earth, nobody else has had it ever, nor will they ever. Our diversity and our differences come from God by design on purpose. And it's funny, because I was preparing for the message and I always talk to Joey as I'm thinking through different things. And I was thinking, did God make anything like kind of the same? I was like, what about the ants? And I was like, yeah, every ant kind of looks alike. And <laughs> Joey's like, well, there's red ants, there's black ants, and there's big fat ants and little tiny ants. And I was like, he was like, yeah, you just don't notice their differences. Does that sometimes happen with us? Our diversity runs deep. Think of the species of animals, and it's not just in mankind. Think of plant life. Think of the different geographical areas of the, the earth. Our diversity runs deep, it's vast. And so we've gotta know that because of where our diversity has come from, that it was not given to us to be negative. Our diversity was not given to us. God knew what he was doing. We know things have been tainted and sin has taken grip on diversity at times, but it wasn't given to us to be negative or divisive. So as Christ's children, we've got to know this. We cannot take a side just to be taken aside. As emotions are getting stirred over so many things, and it just feels like the theme is kind of coming back to our differences when you see the culture, we cannot just be Christians in the pot getting stirred. And you don't always have to pick a side. You need to identify with Christ, knowing that our diversity came from him. We need to give it back to him. Amen? So he didn't make us less than or greater than. Yet somehow, in our fallenness, we look at things, we look at groups, we look at characteristics as better than others when in Christ and God's design was that that was not the case at all. But if we're honest, we're all imperfect in this area. As much as we don't wanna be, as much as in our own efforts, in our own consciousness and awareness, we try to view everything the same, we have to acknowledge family, this is a family moment. Can we have a family moment? We have to acknowledge that just like in every area, we all fall short here, amen. We all fall short, fall short with this, and we've gotta know, and it, it happens at the youngest age. Um, Ramaya, when I had Ramaya, my first child, they put her in my arms and she wiggled open her eyes and they were blue at birth. And I'm smiling, I'm, my first time being mom, I'm looking like, whoa. And so when we're in public with Ramaya and everyone else in our family and our household has dark brown eyes. So we're in public with Ramaya and people go out of their way, they'll stop us and they'll say, oh, you have pretty eyes. And Ramaya doesn't really even know what to say. She's just kind of like, thank you, like kind of irritated, like, okay, I'm tired of you guys telling me this. And one time she was like, mom, why am I the only one in our house that has this color eyes? And I just said, God gave them to you. He has a reason. And she said, well, the kids at school say my eyes are scary. 
and it's funny because this is this is an error too. I'm like, man, when I was a teenager, I bought colored contacts, your eye color, because I wanted to switch my eyes because somehow I thought that was better. But do you see what I mean? We do it without even trying. And so even at the youngest age, kids will find something kind of neutral, eye color, and make one better than the other. They wanted to make it less than people in public stop us and they elevate her eyes and oh look look at the rest of the family but your eyes are so pretty we've got to be aware that we fall short somehow and so this word is coming to each of us everyone to help us find the next direction so that we can grow in how we value diversity and how we use it as a tool to lift Christ amen so the other beautiful thing about diversity is that it tells us about the nature of God And in doing that, we have leverage to tell others about the nature of God through diversity, that God is not boxed in, that he can't be limited by any ideal and that he can't even be predicted. I remember a couple years ago, we were recruiting for the middle school team um, and it was something new, not something Joey and I had had experience in. And I was convicted very strongly that as we recruited a middle school team, it needed to be diverse. It couldn't be my friends, my peers, the people that are most like-minded with me or even from my generation. And I remember praying and I probably gave a lot of y'all a little recruitment slip saying, please come work in next gen. And that was all because God had impressed upon me. Go find different kinds of people. Why? So that our youth could see Christ in different lives, in people in different generations. So God answered my prayer and he gave me Sister Betty Broach to be on our team. And he gave me Caleb Terry to be on our team. And he gave me Faith Green and Karen Green. And then I had me and Joey, Tiara Johnson. But he gave me different people so they could look and see that even in a seasoned age, she's still following Christ. And even after going through college, he's still following Christ. And even though she's got a bunch of kids and a busy life, she's still following Christ. And wait, he's white and he's following Christ. And she's black and she's following Christ. I wanted them to see the gospel on many different lives. And God answered that. And our church has something. I don't know who prayed for us to have diversity, but God has answered us and preserved it. That's another part of the message. Let me stick to my notes. So God, our differences tell us about the nature of God and allow us to tell others about the nature of God. That in creation, it declares his glory, the earth and all he made, that he's limitless. And again, our collective testimonies, him saving people at different ages, the fact that he saved me at 19 and the fact that my husband grew up in church and got saved and is still walking with Christ, all of that, those collective testimonies, the testimonies in this room from people from all different backgrounds speaks and exalts Christ. Our differences tell us that God is saving all people It allows us to declare God's love for all people. And our diversity allows us to to declare his love for all people with evidence that he's saving all people. Amen. Our first identity, and y'all pray with me through this one. I feel like this one is hard and maybe it's not. Our first identity is in Christ. When we begin a new life in him, Jesus Christ That's our primary allegiance. It's our primary identity. He is what we put on. Yeah, I know people see my skin color, my Afro, whatever it may be. People see my age. People may see what I have and think they understand my socioeconomic class. Yeah, I know that's what our perception is, but we need to know who we are, that our primary identity, no matter what, is Christ Jesus. Colossians. Amen. Colossians 3 and 11 and 12 speaks to this. It says, in this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters. And he lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be the holy people that he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. 
Why is, Christ, why is it important that Christ is our primary identity? Because Christ is eternal. All these things about our flesh, they won't last past this life, but Christ will last in us past this life. He will take us on from here to glory. No matter what else describes us, Christ defines us. Amen. No matter what else describes us or how others define us, Christ actually defines us. So when we're in doubt, when it comes to diversity, the next time you're facing a situation where you're uncomfortable because of differences, find Christ, consult Christ. That is our starting point. In Christ, while we are all different, we are one. We're different, but we're one. Galatians 3, 27 and 28 says in the NLT, all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. So there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ. So the divides are brought down. The separation is brought down. Yes, we have our characteristics, but they are engulfed by Christ. God's truth gives all of us as God's children one simple primary identity. Another beautiful thing is that Jesus, before he was about to be taken and give down his life, give over his life to die for us, he prayed that we would be one. He prayed specifically, he said, I'm not just praying for you disciples who are like physically in front of me. I'm praying for everyone who believes in me because of this message. That's y'all, that's me. He prayed for us and his prayer, it just gives me chills. John 17, 20 and 21, he says, my prayer is not for them alone, people in front of me, but I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That's amazing. Because why was he asking for oneness? He wasn't praying for oneness so that we could look powerful, like a powerful group of people, like an army, which we are. He wasn't praying for oneness just even for peace. But he's praying for oneness that people could be drawn to him. It's the same theme, pointing them back to him. So that when we come together here and we exercise forgiveness, then we're moving towards the oneness that Christ has asked for. When we come here to fellowship, despite of our differences, and we love each other through our mourning and through our rejoicing, we are walking out that oneness. And our diversity testifies even more powerfully than if we were all the same. Also diversity is a tool for worship. In Revelation 5 and 9, there's a vision of what it will be like. And it says that they sang a new song with these words about Jesus, that you are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. So just like dancing, we have a dance ministry and dance is a tool to exalt Christ and to worship, just like dancing, just like singing, just like our service of time, just like our offering. Diversity is a tool for worship. And it's a collective worship. You can't do it by yourself. You can only do it in the fellowship of the body. It can only be offered with your brothers and your sisters. So it's a tool for worship to lift up Christ just like every tool for worship God has given us. Have you ever seen it like that? It's important. Because while we can honor God through diversity, it's also possible to dishonor him through diversity. Just like music can be used to dishonor God, diversity, and we've seen it. We've seen it, our history is plagued with it, that diversity can be used to dishonor God. This is another quote from Confronting Christianity. The Bible insists on the equal value and dignity of all humans. Repeat after me, I'm better than no one. And I'm less than no one. 
We are better than no one and less than no one. What beliefs is that truth pressing up against in your lives? Who comes to mind when I say I'm less than no one? Who are the people that have trickled into your thinking that somehow you feel like you're less than? Let's flip the script. When I say I'm better than no one, who are the people that somehow in a a thread of a bias, we begin to somehow believe that we're better than? We are not perfect in this area. So somehow these things infiltrate our life and our thinking. Yeah, but they're older. They're old. I'm better than no one. Yeah, but they're wealthy and I'm in poverty. I am less than no one. They're just babies. They're just kids. If they're crying, take them out to church. And we know, we know. I'm not knocking anybody. We know that that's how it is. When Josiah's fussing, I want to take him out. But Josiah has a place in the ministry of the gospel. We're better than no one, and we are less than no one. We have to recognize, we are safer if we recognize that there is a temptation to think that we are better than or less than someone. We have to acknowledge that, otherwise it's got you. There is a temptation to think we're better than or less than anyone because of any type of characteristic. And then also we can dishonor him by trying to ignore the diversity or to say that we don't necessarily see how God made us different. That misses an opportunity to exalt him and can become an avenue where it's easy to dishonor him because you're ignoring the differences that he intentionally placed in life and mankind. So to deny the fact that those differences are there and then even to deny that some of us have been really hurt by our differences. Some of us, based on nothing we could control, have been put down and belittled, and opportunities have been shut off because of these differences. As Christ's children, we have to acknowledge that. And we have to mourn together and then rejoice together when those walls are broken down and when those chains are broken off. So what does all this about diversity have to do with Bridge of Hope? These are biblical realities. What does it mean for us when just in this room right now, it looks so beautiful (laughs) to see the varieties in this room. What does this have to do with us? So I consulted with a couple of people that were on the DNA team as they developed these core values to kind of figure out, okay, I know our church is diverse, but how did you guys actually get to the point of making a decision that this was our core value? And so these are some of the things that I learned. First of all, our authority, the scripture, the Bible values diversity. Secondly, our congregation is part of a movement, the Church of God of Prophecy International, that values diversity. The Church of God of Prophecy has ministry in 135 nations, and it's probably growing constantly. Diversity is valued at the state level, and you can see it for yourself if you go to any of our state events. If you go to our camping ministry, which is um, given by the state, you'll see the value of diversity. And now I want everyone to just look around, just take a 360 scope of the room. Find somebody different from you and acknowledge the diversity that's in this room, the gift we have been given y'all. Because I think most churches desire diversity and value it, but may not have diversity to the degree that we have. There are congregations praying for diversity and trying to strategize around diversity, but God has opened it wide open for Bridge of Hope Church for a purpose. And that's not to boast on anything. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. It's not to boast, nor is it to put down, but we have a calling because of it. We have a work. We have a responsibility to steward diversity. We have a responsibility to manage it and even protect it. Amen. So 
How do we exalt Christ through diversity then? Because that is why he gave it to us. That he'd be lifted up from this earth. That he'd be lifted up in your schools, in your place of work, in your homes, in your neighborhoods, at the grocery store. That Christ Jesus would be lifted up. That all men, women, children, will be drawn to him. So how do we actually do this? And this is where I was refreshed because I love specific instructions. Like if God would speak to me through the pipeline all the time, I'd be a different person. But he has spoken to us through a pipeline on the issues of diversity from Romans 12. So there are three tasks that we need to focus on as a congregation from this passage. So go back and look at it after this. After this message, go back to Romans 12 and look at what you could do and should do as we take diversity as leverage for Christ, as we use it like a trampoline to lift him up. In Romans 12, verse 3, it says, don't think you are better than you actually are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. So I've traveled this past month more than I had in a while. I've been in airports and things I'm not used to. And so I was at the airport and if you haven't traveled in a while, all the seats in the waiting areas have like chargers in them. So I needed to charge my device. I find a seat to charge my device and there was, so it was me on the end, two empty seats and a woman, happened to be a white woman, sitting next to me. So I sit down, I'm trying to get my bearings. I think I was on the phone. And as soon as I sat down, I see the lady kind of glance over and she had her purse in the chair that wasn't directly next to me, but next to her. And I saw her kind of switch her purse. Oh. And so I failed at this one. Let me start off by saying that. This is not a recommendation. <laughs> so I was very offended. And I read into, read into her actions with a lot of assumptions. And so I gathered my stuff as obviously as I could, and I moved. And I went and found me another seat. And I was on the phone, and I was saying some things in my head. And... It was the wrong narrative because what I did, because I felt like she put me down, I'm then trying to puff myself up and I'm thinking, don't nobody want your purse. I don't need your money. And it got worse and I was like, I have purses at home better than your purse. <laughs> now, think about it with me, I know, I know. that The real was going. And the Lord, and I'm preparing for this message all the while. And it's amazing how much stuff came at me that had to deal with diversity as I'm preparing for this message. Maybe it was just my awareness. But no, what if those things weren't true about me? What if I didn't have nice purses too? And what if I did need some money? Does that then allow me to be less or worse? I began building myself up on things that don't matter. I began to puff myself up because I felt put down and I began to try to raise my level based on things that do not define me. I did the opposite of what verse three is saying because it's saying to be honest in our evaluation of ourselves, measuring ourselves by what? By the faith God has given us. We are to measure ourselves by a gift of grace. And the true measure is how much are you trusting in Christ, period. How much am I trusting in the one who saved me from my sin? See, our boast is not ever going to be in us. It's going to be in how much have we surrendered ourselves to the one who can change all things. The one who makes us who we are. Jesus who connected us with the one who created us and gave us an identity. That's the measure, how much are you trusting in Christ? What faith did he give you and what are you doing with it? Not my money. And yeah, people will put you down. And we see it. We see it in cultures where there is a sense of needing to have this pride about the color of our skin in response to being put down. And I understand advocacy and I understand social justice, but our primary identity again is now in Christ. 
And so I don't get a pass to begin misbehaving when I am put down. I don't get a pass. God is not excusing me. And I even got on the plane later and I was just thinking like, that's kind of funny that that happened. And then as a therapist, I always psychoanalyze myself. And I'm like, well, why did I think she put me down? Maybe if I was her, I would have moved my purse too, just because of comfort. Maybe it wasn't racism. Maybe she didn't think I was poor. I don't know. But I had the conversation. I said, what if God wanted me to connect with her? Because I, I could, would not have heard him say that. Blew that opportunity. What if she needed prayer and I am his child? What if he sat me next to her and had her get my attention so that he could use me? I'm gone. I'm all in another frivolous mindset. But the scripture says to not think better of ourselves than we really are, but be honest in our evaluation of ourselves, measuring ourselves by the faith God has given us. The second task for us, church, is to celebrate uniqueness. Celebrate uniqueness. Verse 4 of Romans 12 says that just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. And then in verses 6 through, I think, 8, it goes through different gifts. And it basically says, however I made you, be you. Be boldly you. The gifts that I've given you, walk in them, bloom in them. And yes, that passage is about our spiritual gifts, but there's a truth that also applies to our differences. Because the same way he gave us our gifts, he made us with certain characteristics. And this verse is saying to be you. Bloom where you are. Don't move, don't apologize, but be authentically you in your uniqueness and celebrate others as they do the same. Be good at being you. Observe how God made you and walk in it. And then Romans 15 and 17 says to accept one another. Accept one another then. Just as Christ accepted you, again, why? In order to bring praise to God, accept one another. So I work for the school system, and before I had Josiah, I worked at a predominantly white school in our area. And the first couple years I was there, I was there for seven years, but the first a couple of years I was there, I noticed that in the winter time, um, most of the students did not own a coat. Or I never saw them wear a coat. They wore a hoodie, a sweatshirt. And then all the boys, they wore basketball shorts. Like even on the almost snowy days when it was really, really cold. And I remember at first I was kind of taking it back like, man, aren't they cold? And I was thinking, no, I wouldn't do that. Like I, I couldn't not wear a coat in the winter because that's how I was raised. That's part of my culture, right? You cover up whether it rains or it's cold. And at first I was kind of taking it back, but then I was able to find a way to celebrate it. I was like, okay, well, those parents, at least they don't have to purchase like a winter wardrobe. And then I looked at the boys <laughs> as they would be in the school. I'm like, they look so comfortable. Like they would also wear the flip flops, not the ones that go between the toe, but the ones that go over the foot. They would wear those with socks. I'm like, they look so comfortable and so free. And I begin to celebrate it. <laughs> That's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to look at things that are different from us that at first are a little off-putting and maybe a little strange, but find a way to celebrate it. We have to celebrate uniqueness. Maybe we're not going to mimic it, but we're going to allow the uniqueness to be found as beautiful and to give God glory through it. We're not going to allow differences to be scary or so uncomfortable that we're not willing to exercise Christ's call because of them. Third task is to love authentically. This comes from Romans 12 and 9. It says, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. And that's in the NLT. It says to hate what is wrong. Not hate people who are doing wrong. Not hate people that are necessarily in different lifestyles, but the sin that is wrong, hate that, not a person. Hold tightly to what is good and love each other with genuine affection. 
take delight in honoring each other, which goes back to celebrating uniqueness. Find a fun way to celebrate differences. But also, love genuinely, love authentically. Bridge of Hope is a great place to practice that because every Sunday and Wednesday and in our fellowship, we have opportunities to re relate to many different people that are nothing like us. But if you don't intentionally do it, it's not just gonna happen. We'll just come here and sit together. But you have so many different people of all generations, of different cultures, even people from different countries who know different languages. Like you can go and you can connect and then genuinely show love to so many different types of people and we need to do it outside of here as well. We gotta leave our comfort zone to love outside of our bubble. And again, if you don't plan it and think about it, it does not just organically happen because we're together. God has done a great thing among us, but in order for the next level to come, we have got to make a choice. We've got to make a choice that counters our culture. We cannot be the social media news feed that splits groups of people and polarizes us against each other. We cannot be that, guys. Our world is crushed and dying, and we are the light of the world because of Christ. We've got to be the light, and it takes a choice. Yes, we know his Holy Spirit does a work in us, but it doesn't take care of everything. We've got to make a choice to allow the Spirit to work. So the praise team can come, and again, we are diverse by design, but we must point to Christ. We've got to use it for positive and not negative. We've got to use it for unity and not division. And we've got to recognize that the purpose of it all is to lift Jesus up. It's gotta remind us that God's hand is not short, that it cannot save, that it can save from tribal cultures. It's not limited to commercialized Western culture. We've got to acknowledge that we fall short because if we don't acknowledge that, we're not gonna do anything. We've got to acknowledge that there are people who need healing because of what they've experienced because of their differences. We've got to acknowledge that some of our anger when it comes to diversity is really pain. We've got to ask the Lord to change the trajectory of where you see the rest of the culture and for him to do it through us. I said for him to do it through us. We must ask him. And so we're going to have a time of prayer. I'm going to read a scripture before we open the altar. And wherever you stand on the spectrum of dealing with diversity, Grace is saying from wherever you are, get up and do what my word has instructed. We're all the same. We all have a step to take next. So I'm gonna leave us with this scripture from Revelation chapter seven, verse nine. And again, this is a vision John saw about what Christ's body was doing and what it looked like in heaven. This is our future. Revelation 7 and 9 says, After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language standing before the throne and before the lamb. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches. Think of our church on Palm Sunday. They were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And church, that is our cry. 
That is what we want to communicate through our diversity, that salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne, who is in control of all of the world's happenings, all of the world's leaders, all of the conflicts. He is even in control of the tragedies we've seen. These recent murders, mass murders, many of which were rooted in issues of diversity. He's still sovereign over all of that. He sits on the throne. Salvation belongs to him and to the lamb. That is what we are saying as we exalt the Lord Jesus through our differences, not just our appearances, but even the differences from within us, even our generations, all of our diversity. This is a word from the Lord, but it is not kumbaya. Can't we get all along and we have good feelings. As Christ's people, we want to take Christ to the world. As he has spoken to us, we want to live out his truth in our world. And, and there are barriers that can inhibit us or keep us from doing that. I want us to pray. Uh, maybe even have, and I'm not talking about long levels of prayer, but I think we need to acknowledge. I want us to ask forgiveness Jesus taught us to pray and part of that prayer is repentance I think in a I think we need to repent for uh, our flesh's response to diversity I don't care who you are I don't care what culture you are there is no individual here who has not responded in inaccurately or poorly to it we want to embrace, uh, so I, I want us to pray that. God, forgive me for any action or attitude that, I've, that I have acted out or passed on to the family or have received and, and allowed it to be as if it was okay. I also want us to pray, God, help us to carry the ministry of reconciliation. If we're going to be Christians celebrating diversity, then we're going to help us, God, to go beyond um, our homogeneous uh, comforts so that we're willing to live in it. And so what I mean by that is, Lord, Help me to live with, live in love with people different like, different than me. Uh, help me to, uh, if, if, if I'm used to a certain economic bracket, Lord, help me to associate with those who do not have as much as me. Uh, if, if I am... I'm young, I'm in my 40s, so help me to identify with those who are older. And obviously in my 40s now, I've crossed over, I'm no longer, can't be considered a young adult. So Lord, help me to be able to identify with young people and students and God help me to carry the ministry of reconciliation. So I want us to pray these three prayers. Let's first pray, God, forgive us uh, as a person, as a family, even as a church for having bias or prejudice towards others because of their differences. Father, today, I want to acknowledge things that I've said jokes that I've made things that I have silently allowed family members to say in my midst without speaking up for your love for all people Father today as your son, your servant and as the people of grace Forgive me and forgive us 
for not always representing you in this world, for being images of intolerance or images of prejudice or, or, or tools of sin. Father, today, I ask for your cleansing blood. I ask that there would be reconciliation. Lord, this, this, this diversity goes to the core. Some of our marriages can't function because they're so different. They just can't embrace. Oh, their family culture is so different. They're warring. Or, but God, today, if we have been tools of the enemy, Father, forgive us. We confess this. We acknowledge it. That we might represent you and your kingdom in this world. Now, Father... I ask that you would cause Bridge of Hope to be a ministry and the, each disciple to be a minister of reconciliation. That we look at people who are different from us and we go to them. We know them. We love them. Uh, we don't go to appease them we go to love help us to love brothers who are different from us and sisters who are different from us and people who are older than us and people whose culture and food is different and their nationality and their status is different and their age and their economic bracket is different and their education is different father if I don't have education help me to go to the one who who is knowledgeable and educated and and get to know them if father I am wealthy and help me to know people who do not have as many means and not so much that I can give something to them but I can know and love them Father, help me to, if I am black and I've only identified with black people, or if I'm white and I've only been comfortable around white people, Father, help me to get to know people from other races and backgrounds. God, help me to, to help me, God, to know people who speak other languages and, and not value myself above them. Father, help us as a church to be a ministry and help us as individuals to be ministers of reconciliation. In the name of Jesus, make us one, Lord. Make us one in this church. I thank you for different cultures and races and economic brackets, but God, you know truth. Make us one. Make us love. Help us to be compassionate and merciful. Father, in the name of Jesus, help us never to look down on people and never to perceive ourselves as less. Father, I pray for men in this environment where, where men have been uh, attacked and seemingly uh, put down in this new emerging culture that celebrates women. Father, today let that prejudice not abide. And in a culture that has such a history of misogyny where women have been relegated to second class status and second, help us as men not to see women as less than but equal and, and to celebrate what you are doing in them and the opportunities you have given to them. Father today make this church a ministry of reconciliation and a reflection of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.